Hi, I am Mikel Alfares, and I'm here to present the Kai paper from Biodata to Soma Data. So this is research that has been conducted under the Affected Consortium, which is a Marie Curie Innovative Training Network funded by the H2020. I work at Plax and Jaume so Primé University this together. Really good papers for this session is um, a paper called From Data to Soma Data by Michel Alfares, Osliki Tsaknaki, Peter Sanchez, Charles Windlin, Mohamed Umer, Karina Sash, and Kia Herk. with KTH Stockholm researchers and researchers at Lancaster University in the UK. So the question that we approach in this paper is how can we as designers engage creatively with biosensing technologies or rephrasing, how is it that biodata can be approached as a design material? So the results of this paper are presented in the form of artifacts, that is biosensing actuation couplings that lead to design insight. I'm going to be showing you muscle activity, which is coupled to sound, uh, to thermal activity, which is coupled to temperature feedback on the neck, and movement synchrony tracking that changes sound features. So if we look at biosensing, I think that we could all agree in saying that these technologies are becoming more and more available these days. So for example, you can go grab an EEG sensor and work with uh, brain waves. You can grab an ECG sensor and work with heart data, breathing cycles, uh, electrodermal activity. I can tell you that you're not performing the movement in a good uh, way because I pay attention to your electromyography. I can look at your accelerometry data and tell you that you're not keeping up with your health routines, that uh, you are uh, not achieving the 10,000 steps that you wanted today. And all these use cases are nice, but they stem from health and performance. So we, as designers, having these technologies at hand, we're wondering whether we could do something different. So enter Soma Design. Soma Design is a design approach that grounds upon the body, uh, and it places importance on the first-person perspective of the designer. So we, in a way, are stepping into the shoes of the user by experiencing ourselves. Uh, Soma Design also calls for cultivating your some aesthetic appreciation, that is learning to pay attention to the body, to the perceptions that your body has. And uh, also Soma Design calls for engaging in the uh, non habitual So in a way, uh, in order to understand the ingrained ways in which we interact or we move, we have to make them strange to break them apart. So imagine that you are designing a knife or cutting bread. So I would ask you to cut the bread with your non-dominant hand so that you all of a sudden become aware of the tiny movements that are involved in this activity. So some of design in terms of tools also uses Feldenkrais therapy, which is a therapy in which we would be guided by a, a, an expert that uh, makes us focus in the different parts of the body and we realize about the differences, connectedness. We also do contact improvisation, which is a type of dance in which we touch each other, we dance with the flow, there's no music. Uh, and then we use uh, body sheets a lot, which are sketching tools in which we draw and add words on how we feel before and after doing an exercise so that we can discuss and reflect upon the changes. So where is it that uh, this design journey started? Well, in fact, it was two years ago when KTH was preparing a training event and they invited Cheryl Agner Kohler, who you see in the picture, and her research uh, brought this sensitizing lab. The sensitizing lab was an activity aimed at uh, getting us attuned to haptics applied to the body. So here I'm given the role of the sentient body in the middle of the picture. Then there is a research conductor next to me on the left, placing vibration and thermal feedback on my, on my body. And then there is the scribe who is documenting everything on the right. So again, very important, we have role. We have the sentient body on the right, we have the research conductor playing with the actuation in the middle, and we have the person in charge of documenting. 
So this way of approaching actuation was very nice, very uh, thought-provoking, actuation close to the body. And we were wondering, okay, could it be that biosensing can be experienced in the same way? So we flew back to Portugal, we took all of our sensors, and we came up with a similar protocol. But in fact, we were biased by then uh, by using too much visual representations. Luckily, we were invited by Nottingham Mixed Reality Lab to prepare a SOMA design workshop on balance. So we took all our materials, like the SOMA bits, which support uh, placing actuation and biosensors around the body. And we had this uh, crazy idea. What if we couple biosensing to actuation? And in fact, it's not that crazy because you are grabbing data from the body and you're making this body aware of the data. So the designer that had the idea uh, had been struggling when crossing a balancing pole, a balancing rod. He would be looking at uh, muscle activity on a screen and not be able to perform the balancing act, not be able to grasp the data meaningfully. Instead, when trying with uh, sound, all of a sudden, we were aware that he was about to fall. So it's not that that anticipation was cool per se, but we were experiencing something altogether. We were sharing the meaning making of muscle activity, and that was amazing. Later on, we were requested to design for synchrony in an event that had to take place in Cattolica di Milano. Here you can see some of our participants playing with body weights and contact improvisation. And Muhammad Umer had this crazy idea of coupling electrodermal activity with heat feedback on the neck. So we would see that uh, the peaks on an EDA signal are translated into heat. And this is cool because you can share your arousal with other partners, for example. But was, what was particularly amazing was that participants realized that the Peltier element, the, the thermal element, could be turned upside down. And no longer we rely on heating elements, but now they are cooling off. And this is just reinterpreting the meaning of EDA, because EDA is not only about peaks emerging, but also peaks dissipating slowly. And this was amazing, again, that uh, we had turned uh, a material, the biodata, into something tangible that we can shape, that we can change. Later on, we created this coupling of movement synchrony, which is based on accelerometry, two accelerometers that are deviating a chord that is played by the computer. And the chord would change pitch when these two artifacts don't move altogether. So when given to participants, they come up with choreographies. They don't speak to each other, but move all together. And they even realized that this uh, mechanism was only working in one direction. So these were pretty simple accelerometers and only worked in an axis. So again, they are appropriating the technology. They are appropriating the meaning making of the data. So by these examples, we created what we call SOMA data. So SOMA data are experiences of biodata from the first person perspective, again, stepping into the shoes of the users. Experiences that uh, enable collective meaning making, so something that is shared among the SOMA design group. And SOMA data doesn't constrain the activity that you are designing for. So if you are designing for balance, for swimming, you don't pick sensors that ruin that activity. So in this paper, I hope that I have convinced you, or that we have convinced you that making some data available to design is possible, that we call for sensitizing ourselves, and that biosensor data is no longer seen as raw data, but socio-digital material to be experienced and molded. So we shape the digital materials, but they shape us. They shape our movements, behaviors, and attitudes. This research is paving our future direction on orchestration or widening, widening the range of possibilities in actuation and sensing. And also, we are more towards uh, sharing the first-person perspectives. So we have shown 
how we create uh, designer engagement. Uh, it's only our path to SOMA data, how we get attuned to our bodies. And we hope to see that uh, more examples of SOMA data will emerge in the near future. So uh, these are only our examples, but SOMA data is about a much wider range of possibilities that I hope to see. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, it was Thanks. a really good presentation. It was uh, easy to follow and, and a really interesting topic. Um, so I've been watching um, the chat to see if there are questions. If you have questions, then please type the questions in the chat so we can bring those up. Um, but first of all, sort of a round of applause for the, the presenter. Um, so, uh, at least I have a, a couple of questions. So the first one is, uh, you started with the live body and then you mentioned biodata and experience and uh, meaning making and so on. Can you say a little bit more about sort of the relation between experiences and uh, uh, the data you have collected and these sensor technologies? So we, I, I think that coming Coming from the engineering perspective, I think that uh, well, we we could uh, see some some research out there uh, on on this uh, performance realm or health realm. So I was interested in something different, which is uh, bringing this technology into design and playing with it. So the aspect of being able to play with the the data that we acquire, being able to to shape it, to integrate it into, into an interaction design uh, uh, was, I, I'm more focused on helping designers uh, embrace this data, not, not uh, particularly for a specific use case or, or a, a use case scenario for the end user, but just uh, making these technologies as, as, others, as other researchers have done in the past, like uh, we have the work from Petra Sandstrom, the work from Jordi Solsona in these in inspirational bits that uh, take some some technologies like uh, I think we we cite them in in the paper that um, take Bluetooth technology for example how how different devices recognize each other and they they made them available to to play with in the design uh, in the design process so. Uh, but uh, in a way, summer design here uh, is very is very appropriate because it starts uh, in training you or, or at least uh, at least uh, calling for you to train yourself in paying attention to the body, which is something that biosensing per se doesn't do. Uh, you you may have a technology that's just telling you authoritatively uh, how how your your body is accomplishing a, a, an action. But I want to be able to to this this uh, meaning augmentation or this uh, information, grab it and play with it. So that's kind of the approach. I'm I'm not sure if I'm answering the question. Okay. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we we do have a few more questions. So the second question I have is: uh, Would you say that this approach can be used to understand whether the biodata is misinterpreted, or will it be as difficult as it? always is in a sense? Uh, I, th I think it can help, but uh, we would never claim that the, that our approach is a, a way to solve uh, these difficulties. Uh, I mean, maybe a way to be more aware. Like, uh, I think we, we pointed, for example, at, at research done by Fili Alawi, who is a, a, a dancer that has engaged in, in galvanic skin response uh, data, for example. So this uh, monitoring arousal and, and um, in, in very active movement performances. And we notice these difficulties that designing with, uh, with uh, biosensing data is, is tricky. And of course, in this, uh, in entering into the design process and making trying to make this uh, data tangible or more able to, to shape, 
we realize of some of the of some of the constraints but i'm i wouldn't claim that we are solving them uh, or that it's it's the panacea for for entering into bio biosensing design okay thank you uh, and then uh, marie louise uh, sundergaard has a question for you hello michael hello. Uh, yeah. So thank you for the presentation. I think that was very interesting. I'm very interested in designing with the with data as well. And I was curious with if the actuation is a crucial part of the SOMA data framework that you are suggesting, and whether you could talk a little bit about these couplings between actuation and sensing that you did, if you see that there's some of those couplings that are more interesting for you from a SOMA perspective. Okay. Okay, then uh, I would have to answer that uh, it is definitely something important because, well, uh, biofeedback has a long tradition maybe in, uh, in therapy, for example, and, and other, other use cases in, in trying to make the user or the patient, whoever is using bio, uh, biofeedback, aware of, of changes that happen within the body. But uh, I still see that uh, there is a gap in, in making those changes perceptible on the body. So we, uh, we use the body to interact with, uh, with the world, with, uh, to, to construct our interactions. So it wasn't until I, I went and spent time at KTH and started to, to try to get attuned to, to my body. And by that, I mean that we, we actually played with haptics as the, the research that uh, Agner Kohler brought, for example, this sensitizing labs were grounded on placing actuators that make you vibrate, that make you uh, heat up or, or cool down. So this was uh, really crucial to, to make this connection between data, stuff that we are capturing within our bodies, this is what we came up with later on, with stuff that can be perceived on the body. And this is something that, for example, we had an experience with uh, screen-based displays. I, I'm not saying that screen-based displays are, are, are bad, but I needed to, to hold on to my body to, to understand this data differently. And that, uh, that cannot get rid of actuation that easily. I, I think it's a good path, path to follow. Like, I don't know if, if you're aware, but there are other, uh, other projects like, uh, I've seen these uh, these uh, galvanic skin conductance uh, T-shirts that color up, or the the effective uh, chronometry work that Umer uh, Muhammad Umer has presented. Uh, I'm very interested into bridging the gap, and that that bridge happens, for example, when uh, the effective effective tracking crosses it by using vibration, and now all of a sudden you again are aware of the changes that are happening in your body. You couple uh, EVA peaks in this case to, to vibration. So you, in the same act, whatever you are doing, you, you, it grounds you to your body in a different way. So actuation, I, I'd say, is a crucial thing to keep. And we are, we are envisioning future work on, on breathing. Breathing is a very interesting, interesting signal that we kind of control. We, we need it to be there all the time, otherwise we would die. But uh, it also opens up for for interaction. We can use it as a as an input to to start and stuff uh, interfaces. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I I'm pretty sure that it will it will bring some some more insight if we if we make it work. But I haven't I haven't achieved it yet. Okay, so, sorry for interrupting here, but I think no, we no need to move to the next um, paper. So thank you very much, and a round of applause from all of us. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, we need to move on to the next paper. It's uh, a paper called Touching and Being in Touch with the Menstruating Body. It's by Nadia campro Wojtuk, Marie-Louise Sandegard, Marielene Kol Kolfi Feliz, and Madeleine Balam. Um, this uh, also got uh, a best paper nominations, so you're so welcome. Uh, it will be very exciting to hear about this work. Uh, please welcome, the floor is yours. 
Hi, thank you. I hope everyone can hear me all right. Um, okay, I'm going to give this presentation live. So um, maybe make, make I let me know if the connection drops or anything. Um, yeah, and I hope it goes well. Thank you and um, welcome to for joining this presentation and discussion on our paper titled Touching and Being in Touch with the Menstruating Body. I'm Nadia Campowaitak. My co-authors are Marie-Louise Yul Sondergaard, Marianela Siolfi Felice, and Madeline Balam. Our paper describes the design deployment and discussion of a research through design work called Curious Cycles. Curious Cycles is a set of objects and interactions which invite people who menstruate to explore their menstruating body throughout a full menstrual cycle, which is approximately a month. While there's been a rise in digital products and services concerning menstrual cycles and fertility in the industry, these tend to approach the body from techno-solutionist perspectives, framing menstruation as a problem to be remedied or controlled through technology and casting aside the pluralism of menstrual experiences and bodies. These technologies also seem to intentionally avoid touching the body and its fluids, especially menstrual blood. And as previous literature in HCI has pointed out, these technologies focus around the body rather than engaging directly with it. Therefore, to situate a bit, this project draws from previous work in women's health um, and interaction design, with, uh, also from feminist HCI, and is also influenced by somesthetic interaction design or soma design. So in this work, we propose touch as a way of knowing and understanding one's menstruating body, and this includes its fluids. I'd also like to mention that throughout the presentation, there are a few pictures of menstrual blood and some partial nudity, which will be indicated on the previous slide. So when we use touch, we draw from the literal and metaphorical meanings of touch discussed by feminist technoscience scholars, Karen Barad and Maria Puig de la Villa Casa. So instead of producing knowledge by observing the body through vision, through data on a screen or things happening at the periphery of the body, we're interested in ways of generating knowledge through touch, touching the material, touching the body and its fluids. Touching can trouble or blur the idea that we have of who is doing the touching. As Bella Casa says, to touch is to be touched. And to touch oneself, to touch the menstruating body, entails touching and being in touch with the self. So all touching entails the infinite alterity, so that touching the other is touching all others, including the self. And touching the self entails touching the strangers within. And this is a quote from Karen Broad. We find that these theories resonate clearly with our motivation to design menstrual technologies that support noticing and appreciating the body, but also as poetic metaphors that describe the process of how this act of touch has potential to create knowledge about the self, about being in touch with the self. So with this work, we ask, how can this be done in the context of menstrual cycles? How can knowledge and world-making processes be done through touching the menstruating body? So we created the Curious Cycles Kit uh, <clears throat> through a process of first person uh, perspective design explorations, workshops, and consultations with experts in fertility and menstrual cycles. It's also worth mentioning that the values associated with menstruation vary widely across cultures and that this project took place in Sweden. The kit was designed to include tangible artifacts, a poster and envelopes with drawing and writing prompts. This method shares many of the intentions present in Bill Gaver's cultural probes or Jane Wallace's work on design probes. The objects were linked to a poster, which in the style of an advent calendar, participants would open at different moments in their cycle and were prompted to interact with these objects. One of the primary prompts in the kit was to collect samples of your own menstrual blood, cervical mucus and saliva, and to observe them attentively under a smartphone microscope, which had the shape of a 3D printed eye. These fluids were chosen because they are important signals and markers throughout the cycle. Another object in the kit was a handheld mirror and lamp, which prompted participants to closely observe their vulva, either while menstruating or not. With this, we intended to enable a kind of observation that goes beyond just looking, but looking closely or to look with fingery eyes at an almost touching closeness. This sort of interaction has been very present throughout the history of women's health, and notably, vaginal self-examinations with speculums and mirrors were a central part of workshops organized by women's health collectives in the USA um, throughout the 1970s. 
when I told my mom about this project that I was working on, I, she immediately bought me a copy of the edition that she had of Our Bodies Ourselves, which detailed how to perform these examinations at home. Therefore, these took place in non-medical and mundane surroundings, inspiring comfort and playfulness. And this was something we wanted to share with Curious Cycles. In the kit, the mirror slash lamp and the microscope could be paired together to observe the fluid samples. Other objects and interactions included a heat pad with a body mapping activity, similar to the one that Mikel has presented, and tools to aid collecting and observing the bodily fluids. We gave five sets of curious cycles to five women living in Stockholm, Sweden. They were of different ages and had different cultural backgrounds and were not currently using hormonal contraception. As well as the kits, each participant made use of an individual Instagram account, which they used as a visual diary. So the ways in which participants touched and looked at their menstruating body involved direct skin contact with the fluids, but also they used tools and secondary materials such as their menstrual hygiene products. Therefore, their experiences of touch varied greatly depending on these products, the history of their use, and the spaces where the touching and looking was performed. One participant who's named Maria in the paper said that she paid attention to the color of the blood in order to tell if she was healthy or not, but that she wasn't only interested in touching and looking at her body for understanding biological processes or for conceiving or avoiding pregnancy, but also just for the sake of knowing and exploring, exploring her own body. Several participants managed to see the ferning patterns in their saliva, which are a sign of ovulation. As participant called Emma explained, I did this every day until I saw the ferning patterns. I needed to see them. I really enjoyed it because I had no idea that the patterns would change. And I thought it was actually really aesthetically beautiful as well. And seeing how, the, how aesthetically pleasing it was, it also kind of gave me this new appreciation for it. So by seeing menstrual blood, mucus and saliva as something more precious or valuable and knowledge bringing rather than waste. And through the power of looking and touching over time, participants strive for the sense of aesthetic appreciation of admiration and attunement with their own body. Therefore, we believe that the future, um, future menstrual cycle technology should help to directly challenge the stigma and the misunderstanding of uh, these fluids and in particular menstrual blood. Although several participants already had a certain closeness to their bodies, they expressed the need to intentionally be invited to touch. Participant Laura explained how she always thought about looking um, at herself with a mirror, but she never did it until she had to, which was during the study. Therefore, we see the role of menstrual technologies to be a provider of this invitation to entice touch by curiously looking, as well as supporting and confirming the knowledge of doing it. For example, one participant recalled that she would have benefited from an ovulation test to confirm what she learned by touching her cervical mucus. Another participant commented on the need to know what she was actually seeing under the microscope. So in addition to the knowledge that some of the mainstream menstrual technologies um, deliver, such as menstrual trackers that quantify the body, we must design menstrual technologies that support and complement the knowledge obtained through touch. Another thing that happened during the deployment of um, the Curious Cycles kit was that participants unexpectedly followed each other through their online diary and created an improvised network of support, giving each other advice on how to use the tools, but also encouraging the content that they shared. The fact that the Curious Cycles kit took up space in the participants' homes and required a fair amount of time dedication revealed tensions that might exist when sharing these menstrual experiences. For example, one participant said she found it funny how these things existed in her home, um, referring to the objects in the kit. And she explained this as she showed me a picture of how she had put them on a tray and then she would move them to a hidden place when she had guests over. Also, another participant made her experience more visible by provoking her partner and leaving the objects in sight. These stories of sharing or sheltering their experiences serve to highlight how ecologies for menstrual experiences need to be considered in design how these menstrual technologies become part of an already existing ecology of artifacts and social actors. 
In this work, we have shown that designing beyond the boundaries of the body can become a way to know and understand both the body and the self. And we'd like to make a call to incorporate um, bodily fluids in our designs. And as Maria Puig de la Bella Casa puts it, the world is constantly done and undone through encounters, which are not always those we might expect. The question of how we learn to live with others, being in the world is an opening to becoming with, to be touched as much as to actively touch. We hope that our work can inspire the Kai community and that we have made a small dent in reconfiguring the societal discourse around menstruating bodies. Finally, I'd like to end this presentation with a hopeful yet yeah, a raw depiction or metaphor of what it's like to coexist with our bodies and our menstrual experiences by one of the participants in the study. And she says, my feelings towards my menstruation could be compared to those I have towards bees. I don't enjoy being around them, but I appreciate the services they do. And every time they come back, I am glad that the world I know still exists as in not being pregnant or still having fruit on the trees. And this paper was truly a collaborative effort. So I'd like to thank my co-authors, Marie-Louise, Maya, and Madeline for being part of this work. I'd also like to thank the participants in the study for sharing their stories and the people and places who helped with the design work and participant recruitment and to everyone involved in the CHI process, the CHI submission process. And that's it, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, we do have uh, a number of questions here. So uh, I think Lunis first. Uh, I wonder if Luna has some problem with the microphone. So in that case, I can read it. So she asks, uh, in the 70s, self-examination was part of an empowerment action to take back the body from the female, uh, oh, sorry, from the male dominated medical profession. You make a connection to the 70s through the our body, uh, ourselves, are there other connections or perhaps does this project seek to do something else? Uh, what type of emancip emancipation is it aimed to facilitate, if any, because it seems like this has emancipation purposes too, from what? Okay. The, the whole um, question is in the chat if you wanna look, look at it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lona, for that question and a lot of questions. Um, so I think mostly I made the connection to the um, 70s um, and that sort of uh, female health movement because it, I think it might be the most documented um, um, movement that that incorporated these these um, these similar practices. But um, so when you refer to emancipation, I think I think the the, um, the one thing that that came a lot um, through the mirror. One thing that was really interested is that um, before we were kind of thinking of this idea of of touch, because the mirror is is um, is more looking, right? But it's a sort of looking that kind of involves this kind of like what I said the the more like looking with fingery eyes, the looking really closeness. And I think we we saw a difference between that kind of looking and the looking that you do on like, when you look at an anatomical figure of the vagina, for example, but instead you're, you're looking at your own, you know, it's happening at the body. Um, so I think that there's a lot of value in, in that kind of differentiation. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know if, um, yeah, I don't know if that answers yeah. your question or you'd like to say a bit more about it. I don't know. I hope, Luna, you're okay with this. Um, we also have a question from Alex Taylor. Alex? Um, hi, hi there, Nadia. Hi. Um, I feel like I might have skipped someone else who had a question. Is that Sarah? Sarah Homewood asked about um, the ages of your participants. Okay, um, maybe I can answer that one quickly um, before yours, Alex. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. So the ages of the participants were from ages 22 to 37. Um, and we kind of talk about that a bit more in the paper. But um, I think I think it's definitely important to to do work at, at different stages of the menstrual cycle. Specifically, there's the stages of menarche and um, menopause, which are um, both the beginning and the end, sort of of the of the menstrual life, sort of to say. Um, and and those it, itself are, are really interesting. And the Women's Health Group at KTH is already doing um, work on those specific. Um, on those specific populations. So, yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I was really interested and I really like the idea of drawing on um, Puebla, Casa and Barad on, with um, their ideas of touch and the way I read think they start to use a different, different forms of knowing that might not be um, sort of along the lines of established um, techno science. Um, and I, so I was thinking as you were talking, and I, I'm sure there's more of this in the paper, that, that what do those ideas of touch um, in feminist techno science bring to, to what you're discussing, other than just being other new ways of thinking or alternative ways of thinking about bodies? And so I, and when you talked about ecologies, I really like the idea that bodies. Of to be, but might extend into cases and relations with other bodies. Um, so I, I guess I was wondering whether that's something that you've explored. And I, I feel like that then starts to really get at things that Puig de Casa talks about that is not um, a confirmation of singular body, bodies or individual bodies, but rather a way of thinking about. Um, bodies being enacted, um, always being enacted. And I wondered if that was something that you touched, that you built on in the paper at all. Yeah, so, um, so these, I mean, these theories were really, I, yeah, I really like these theories as well. And um, I think they have, um, whoops, I, sorry. Um, yeah, I think that the way that we were applying it kind of to this design work was um, kind of taking this, this, the pure like action of touching, right? So the pure like touching the body and how this can then, you know, kind of trouble the idea of like exactly like who's doing the touching, like are you touching your body or is it like your butt, who's touching? And then it, that implies that you're kind of touching yourself, right? And what Kind of is the self and that and that was super interesting because then it kind of implies that if you're touch if you're using that the act of touch it has this potential to create knowledge about your body but then kind of where does that end right and then it kind of could go you could you could take that onto like other bodies as well and i think in in the paper we have a few examples of how um specifically these activities of touch and touching one's own body um, we're also kind of affecting the others and the surroundings. Um, like there were, there was, uh, some participants who were talking about how their, their partners were reacting to this or their cohabitants. And, um, I think, I think then the meaning of touch goes beyond just like the actual, like who's doing the touching, like with their fingers or their body, but like how this act is, is actually like <laughs> touching the other people surrounding them. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we need to move on. So thanks for a great uh, presentation and uh, a round of applause for you as well. So thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you all. We need to move on to the third paper in this session. It's uh, a paper called Soma Design and Century uh, Misalignment. It got the Honorable Mention Award uh, and it's written by Paul Tennant. Uh, Joe Marshall, Osleki, Saknaki, uh, Charles Windlin, uh, Windlin Kia Höck, and Mikael Alfaras. Um, and it will be presented by Paul. So um, please welcome, the floor is yours. Hello. I need to share my screen. All right. 
oh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing when I try and share my screen. We cannot see it now. Yeah, when, I, when I try to share my screen, I get a message saying host disabled participant screen sharing. Hmm. Ah, there we go. Oh, it's working. Uh, no, it isn't. Uh, it's not my screen. I've still got the same error. Mm -hmm. It's telling me, telling me that whoever's hosting this is disabled screen sharing. Did somebody, did, I don't know, did you kill the previous screen? Oh, my, yeah. my is going to fix it. She's going to make you into a co-host. Okay. Uh, please just wait a sec and the problem will... I cannot make anybody a co-host, it, it's only Barry who can. So Paul should be a co-host, that's done. And now Paul should be able to share. But yeah. also, Paul, if you can please disable the annotations from participants. Yes. Great. Do that now. Right. Uh, and where's the setting for that? <laughs> Uh, it seems like all my Zoom menus disappeared when I shared my screen. Ah, ah, found it. It's on a different screen, sorry. <laughs> Disable participant annotation, done. And uh, optimize share for full screen video clip. Okay, right, everybody's ready. I will, can you see my screen? Yes. Lovely, right. Hi everybody, um, I'm here to talk about our paper, Soma Design and Sensory Misalignment. It's a collaboration between the University of Nottingham and KTH. It's by me, Paul Tennant, and also Joe Marshall, Vasiliki Tsaknaki, Charles Windlin, Miguel Alfaris, and if you couldn't guess from the title, Kia Hook. Now, a reasonable first question might be, what is Soma Design? Well, Soma Design is a design philosophy based around what Richard Schusterman called Somaesthetics, where Somaesthetics is a portmanteau of Soma and Aesthetics. Soma being a holistic connection of the mind, body and emotion and social engagement. And Aesthetics are simply how we engage with the world around us. So Soma Aesthetics, our body engages with the world around us. It's a first-person design method, one where designers filter design options through their own somesthetically trained experience. And one common technique for doing this is something called defamiliarization. In defamiliarization, designers take everyday experiences and find ways to make them strange. And because they're strange, it focuses inspection of the experience and introspection of how the experience feels. I'm going to give you an example. I want you to think about your breathing for a moment. Just breathe in and breathe out and breathe in, and breathe out again. Now I want you to not think about your breathing, and of course you can't, uh, until such time as you're distracted from it. So let's distract you from it, because it's kind of annoying thinking about your breathing. Next thing I want you to do is just tilt your head 90 degrees. Tell you what, follow me round. Okay, good. Now, I want you to think just for a moment, I won't keep you in this position for long, about your neck and your back and all the interconnected bits of your body which you're feeling different sensations in because your head's tilted off to one side. Just take a moment. Okay, you can come back now. I realise it would be uncomfortable if I gave you the entire talk with your head off to one side. Now another reasonable question you might ask is what is sensory misalignment? 
Well, let's start with sensory alignment. Sensory alignment is a property of interactive systems, especially the so-called immersive technologies. And it's where the sensory input that you receive from one or more of your senses while using the system is consistent with what the other senses are telling you. So if, for example, you visually appear to be moving around, then your inner ear should be telling you you're moving around as well. And most traditional presence research says that the more consistent sensory modalities you deliver, the more presence and therefore the better experience. Now the sensory misalignment argument says actually there's quite a lot to be gained by deliberately misaligning or embracing the misalignment of those senses. You might actually want to deliver incorrect information to the senses in order to generate a thrilling, exciting, engaging or just curious experience. Soma design is a key research focus at KTH and sensory misalignment is one of the mixed reality labs. So in a fit of enthusiastically international collaboration, we decided to mix them together in a pot, throw them at the wall and see what stuck. Now the pot in question was a two day workshop in Nottingham where we mostly baffled our colleagues by lying around on yoga mats and calling it work. We framed the workshop around balance and so we used a set of devices, for example, Soma bits, biosensors and VR headsets, and some early prototype experiences, a VR balance beam, a VR flying harness and an augmented guitar. And we used all of this to ask some questions of what our Soma was doing when we balanced and what happened when we misaligned our sensory inputs. So here's a couple of images from the workshop. On the left, we have the VR balance beam, which uses a misalignment where as your head moves away from the beam, your horizon is rotated, which makes you feel like you're losing your balance. Now, this is a little hard to grasp what I mean without trying it, but let me try to demonstrate. As I move my head to the left, the image rotates and back again. Now, of course, you were seeing me rotate when in fact I would be seeing my horizon rotate. Moving swiftly on. On the right, we've got the flying harness. Uh, in this example, researchers are holding a vibrating soma bit against the flyer's back, which leads to a very interesting sensation of spinning in place. If you'd like to try that, do a handstand, get somebody to stroke your back with, say, an electric toothbrush, but maybe not right now. Now, soma design being primarily a first person method is necessarily concerned with individual reflection. Now the problem is individual reflection doesn't always make for a great group activity, so we shared those reflections using the common method of drawing on a body sheet. You can see one in the image here. And then we discussed what we'd written on the sheets and what it meant, what we felt. And using this common frame of reference went some way to helping us communicate what are really quite complex so many experiences. We recognised, however, that there's a great deal of nuance to those individual reflections. And so we decided to draw on that as a method. And in fact, in the paper, we quite unusually present these detailed first person accounts of our experiences as a starting point for the discussion. Here's a couple of examples of those individual accounts. Here's Jay on the balance beam and see if you can guess who Jay is. So, yeah, I've been doing tightropes hand balancing and things for years but the moment someone put that vibration thing on my foot it was suddenly like I was like a beginner again <clears throat> I guess it made me realize how much I use my feet for actually balancing when I'm walking on things just like you do when you're hand balancing you use your hands a lot to keep the balance and then here's V on the flying harness again feel free to guess who V is the most interesting and at the same time confusing experience was the illusion that the vibration applied on my back created. I felt spinning around myself and slightly dizzy. So what have we learned from all this faffing around? Well, for one thing, we've extended our understanding of sensory misalignment. We started the workshop thinking that a visual misalignment would throw off balance in an interesting way, and sure, it does, but when we reflect on our experience, balance turns out to be a much more complex process than we thought, involving lots of different senses and sensations. And almost all the examples of sensory misalignment that we've made so far and that appear in the literature have been geometrical, that is, they take a sense and shift it, for example, rotating the camera when you move in the tightrope example. But we saw with our study that, for example, adding noise to a specific sense, such as adding vibration to the feet when moving along the balance beam, can also be a really powerful way to misalign. 
The takeaway from this for sensory misalignment is the need to take more consideration of the bodily activity. So for balance, we should think about what it means to balance, what it means to be in balance, what are the senses and sensations involved, and how might perturbing those be interesting. It's really a focus shift from misalignment first to soma first, from considering the external, that is, what should we send to the senses, to the internal, how does each sense interact with the task. We also learned a lot about pluralism in experience. That deep somesthetic appreciation of the experiences and the associated discussions led us to see that different individuals have very different experiences, and indeed the same individual might have different experiences at different times. For example, there are different ways of approaching an activity, so an expert approaches an activity very differently to a novice. We use different sets of sensory cues to perform those activities, so some of us watch our feet when balancing, some of us watch the horizon. We have different physical relationships with an activity, so those of us who have a lot of core strength did really quite well in the flying harness, and those of us who have a lot of core cake do rather less well in the flying harness. We also found that different experiences could be had based on what prior activities we've been doing, so that spinning effect I mentioned earlier, that was greatly heightened after performing a Feldenkrais activity. All sorts of differences, fitnesses, aches, pains, tiredness, familiarity, emotional relationships, all these kinds of things affect the way we experience activities. And what does it mean to have a shared experience if we're all experiencing different things? This work has also made us think about orchestration. Uh, somatic experience is after all not just a single point in time, but rather it's something continuous. We should think about designing experience to take us on some kind of somatic journey, or to put it another way perhaps, a somatic trajectory. And these trajectories might take us through comfort and uncomfort, novice and expert, challenge, catharsis, and so on. So when we think about orchestrating experiences, as we often do from cue to gift shop, we should be considering the, the soma throughout that whole process. So, now we've come full circle. I started this presentation talking about soma design, and in particular defamiliarization. Well, sensory misalignment is an incredibly powerful way of doing that defamiliarization. I want to give you an example. For most people, walking is very much an everyday activity, but in our VR balance beam experience, even without the balance beam, if we turn the effect up far enough, we can take away your ability to walk. Turn it up some more, and we can take away your ability to even stand on your own two feet. That's certainly a way to make walking unfamiliar, although it does occur to me now that it sounds like something that could equally be achieved with a large glass of gin. Beyond defamiliarization, we might also consider the problem of soma communication. I've mentioned that it can be hard to articulate somatic experiences. We suggest then that perhaps misalignment could be used as a communication tool. You say, this experience makes my legs feel heavy. I say, okay, let's make some weighted trousers and I'll see what it feels like. So I'm going to leave you with a mental image of me trying to walk down the street wearing inexplicably heavy trousers. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for a really good presentation. Uh, let's see if we have some questions here. Um, I would be happy to start with the first question. You talked about this body sheet uh, as part of the method, and you also talked about reflection and shared reflections as being part of the method. Can you tell us a little bit more about the, the use of these body sheets uh, and also what worked and what didn't work uh, as you expected? So yeah, um, in the workshop, we had a, a whole series of kind of scripted activities from a, a body scan at the beginning, um, Feldenkrais activities, um, some interactive um, contact improvisation, and also some work with the balance between the flying harness, the guitar, and, and so on. And before each one of those activities, we performed, we, we um, wrote out a body sheet, uh, and then we wrote a second one after. And in each case, we then had a, a kind of separate group discussion where we talked through what we'd written on our body sheets. Not so much holding up the body sheets, but using them as a kind of aid memoir. So it was a kind of immediate uh, write down what you feel. But we did find that body sheets give you an instant moment in time, and they're actually quite hard to demonstrate the passage of time across. And I think that's it's necessary to have the discussion to kind of drive that understanding of soma being a journey. And that's kind of where we got to somatic trajectories from this idea that, that the body sheet 
there's a journey that happened between that first body sheet and that second body sheet and none of that information is preserved there which i think is, is something that needs more research to investigate um, but we found them really useful as a in particular i think as a common way of describing our our sensations so a kind of boundary object for the discussion okay okay sounds good so uh, kia also has a question oh, no. <laughs> no, it was just a discussion that we've had on and off uh, that I think you should um, you should reflect on or tell people about is the that we were meeting two two uh, research groups or two design groups meeting and is that a good idea or a bad idea and what happens? So I mean I think I, I think we can we can use the evidence of a successful paper as the suggestion that it was a good idea but it's a really interesting activity right because. Um, so we've been aware of KTH's SOMA research for quite a long time, and um, KTH has been aware of our, our never-ending stream of strange, thrilling experiences. But in both cases, we'd never really experienced what those things felt like. And sticking to fairly disparate research groups into a room together and getting them to play with each other's methods turned out to be a really interesting activity. And it's, it's completely changed the way I've been approaching my own method my own practice um and you know hopefully some folks in kth might be having a similar feeling that that the this opportunity to to kind of um defamiliarize your own research methods so almost like what we do when we do some design this kind of process of defamiliarization well doing a workshop using somebody else's methods performs a defamiliarization on your own practice and i think that's a very worthwhile activity Great. Uh, we have um, room for a final question from Doug Svarnes. Hi. Um, yeah, very interesting talk. And defamiliarization is in, in art very much used for as a way of provoking reflection. And to what extent is your, to what extent are you designing for an experience more from a hedonic perspective or designing for reflection? I think this is an interesting one for separating the two groups. So in the mixed reality lab, we tend to design these quite kind of fearsome, uh, thrilling experiences. And from our perspective, looking at the defamiliarization makes us think about new experiences design, which are unfamiliar and strange. Um, whereas I think from KTH, defamiliarization has been used more as a, a kind of method of understanding everyday experiences. And perhaps the everyday experiences still get designed albeit through that defamiliarization. So I think we've taken slightly different angles on, on what the, the use of it is for, uh, or at least what we do with finding those strange experiences. And um, I think, well, I would like to think that we'll both, again, both go away from that, taking, that, taking those slightly different perspectives on it. It's certainly been very interesting for us to, to actively sit back and try to defamiliarize the, the work that we were already doing. Um, and I agree, it's something that's that it, it, it's not a it's not a new method, but I think it's interesting to look into new methods of doing it, which is one of the reasons sensory misalignment seemed interesting because it's quite a new method of doing things. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks again for a really interesting talk. Uh, a round of applause for you as well. And great thanks to, to all of you for a really active and engaging uh, session. I think we have uh, done a really good job in having this uh, session online. So great thanks to all of you. Thank you, everybody.